Thanks for inviting me. The title of the talk is Music Training and Non-Musical Abilities, Association or Causation. So um, why would we care about this issue of whether um, it's a causal one or not? Why do academics care? Well, first of all, the notion is relevant to whether the brain is uh, divided into separate regions that are independent, and we call that modularity. And so that would be um, relevant then if, um, for interventions that are based on the possibility of plasticity. So change in one module or experience in one module would, would be unlikely to have any effect on another module if, in the brain if they're truly distinct. And it's also relevant to the notion that there are special links in the brain between different abilities. So some people believe that there's a special link between music and math, or music and spatial skills. Music and language is one that's uh, very kind of a hot topic today in uh, our field. Why would the public care? Well, transfer, even though far transfer seems like a kind of crazy idea, it's actually central to our notion of going and getting an undergraduate degree, for example. So nobody thinks that's... Well, everybody, I think, believes that getting a bachelor's degree has some wide-ranging benefits that extend well beyond uh, the field that you're studying, whether it's philosophy or psychology or chemistry. <clears throat> and uh, since the publication of an article which generated sort of the Mozart effect phenomenon, the public has been uh, fascinated with the idea that exposure to music, whether it's listening and then that sort of morphed into uh, music training, whether uh, musical experiences have positive non-musical side effects. And uh, the notion is that if you defend uh, music training because it has collateral benefits that are not musical, like let's say for uh, IQ or uh, language or whatever uh, uh, you're claiming, then it's less likely to be cut from school curricula. So it has a kind of a political agenda that makes it attractive uh, to members of the public who care about music training. Now, what's the problem? Why can't science just figure this out? Um, well, much of the evidence of associations between, um, <coughs> uh, much, much of the evidence uh, for links between music training and non-musical abil abilities is about associations. So we're looking at uh, people who either have or do not have different amounts of music training in the general population, but that's a correlation and we can't infer causation from that. So in other words, there's very little evidence for a causal association. And what I'm going to try to do today is evaluate uh, what there is out there. And we also know that individuals who take music lessons differ from other individuals in multiple ways. So I'm going to try to convince you that, at least in Canada, when a kid starts to take music lessons, they're likely to differ from other children in uh, demographic personality and cognitive uh, variables. So the question is then whether music training is the consequence of these individual differences or uh, music training is causing individual differences, for example, in intelligence or other cognitive abilities. Now, why is there a problem? Well, the problem is that it's virtually impossible to conduct randomized controlled experiments for substantial durations of time. So I did it once for a full year, and uh, we had uh, about a 10% dropout rate, attrition rate, uh, which we deemed okay at the time, but uh, you wouldn't want that to be um, get any worse. <coughs> and uh, so the longer the training you have, the greater the attrition would be, and then if the kids who drop out of the music training, they're not likely to be similar to the kids who stay in, so then the internal validity of your experiment is uh, ruined. And uh, we also found that the controlled intervention um, that we uh, instigated or implemented, even though it was actually taught at the Royal Conservatory and was actual programs that um, uh, were run by the Royal Conservatory, uh, it was, had little resemblance to real life music lessons in the sense that we had to give them for free in order to randomly assign kids and then the children didn't practice. And so even though there are all these associations, another problem is that scientists, and this is particularly endemic uh, among neuroscientists, have started in kind of a uh, byproduct of the craze over plasticity and the notion that your brain can change, have become obsessed uh, with the notion that music has these positive side effects. So they look at musicians and non-musicians and then they infer causation. And I'm not being a smart aleck here. This is really true and rampant. So these are just two examples from uh, 
Posh Neuroscience Journals from 2016. So that's the actual title, Music and Words in the Visual Cortex, the Impact of Musical Ex Expertise. And that is from a quasi-experiment, so there's no uh, inferences of causation that can be made. This one had a, a more sensible title, uh, Professional Music Training and Novel Word Learning from Faster Semantic Encoding to Longer Lasting Word Representations. But in the actual abstract, it says music training influences semantic aspects of language processing, and again, from a quasi-experiment. The second one is uh, published by Stanislaw Dahan, uh, who's one of the most famous cognitive neurosciences in the world, and also uh, Isabel Peretz, who you know and who did this uh, lecture before. So um, really, that's a problem where correlation has just slipped into causation, and if it's in the music realm, you're safe to infer it, and it's a mystery to me and to Frederick, I think. Now, the overview of the talk today is I'm going to talk what we know about associations between music training and different non-musical abilities and what evidence for causation we have. And then how individuals who uh, take music lessons or don't take music lessons differ from other individuals. And finally, uh, present a conclusion. Okay, so starting off with the first topic, associations between music training and non-musical abilities. <clears throat> what do we know? Well. Uh, first of all, if we start at a, a level where we're not talking about such far transfer, it is true that musically trained individuals often outperform their untrained counterparts on different kinds of tests that involve listening. So they can be music perception, pitch perception, and speech perception. So for example, if a kid, a, a six-year-old, takes music lessons for uh, a year, and then you say, is the computer playing this song right or wrong, and you play this, the kid who has music lessons is more likely to tell you that the computer played it wrong. And we also know that the more, uh, when you have uh, more training, you can detect uh, smaller mistunings to a familiar melody. So on this particular paradigm, you just have to say whether a familiar song is played in tune or out of tune. It's played with sine waves, so it sounds bad, but you just have to identify whether there's a tuning mistake or not. So you're supposed to say wrong. That's right. And that's wrong, but not as wrong as the first one. And the point is that the more training you have, the smaller the differences in those mistunings you can detect. Uh, people are also better with music training at detecting uh, pitch disruptions when they extend to speech. So here's a phrase uh, in French. La fille est assise par terre, feuilletée un livre d'image. So the last part of it is a child is sitting on the floor leafing through a, a picture book. And in the livre d'image, uh, she says there'll be a pitch excursion to the D of d'image, or the second last syllable. And everybody can tell this. La fille est assise par terre. But musically trained people have uh, larger uh, brain excitation patterns when it's a smaller change, and they're more likely to tell you that there's uh, been a, a pitch disruption. La fille est assise par terre, un livre when it's more subtle like that, which isn't such a violation. And there's also some evidence, although it's inconsistent now, that musically trained individuals are better at uh, perceiving speech and noise. So for example, this could be a trial. You have to tell what the speaker is saying. <laughs> the signal to noise ratio is very low there. Here it gets a little better. It's not very loud, but. So she's saying they have two empty bottles in an English accent. and. Uh, in some instances, musically trained people are better at those tasks than on others, but not always. So, but it is safe to, confer, uh, to infer that musicians and musically trained individuals are particularly good listeners. Does music, plays a causal, does music play a causal role in these um, results? Well, there are some uh, true experiments that have random assignment uh, that have uh, been published. 
The problems to the causal evidence, and we don't, I mean, in the case of actual musical stimuli, if music didn't make you a better music listener, there's going to be a problem, right? But whether it extends beyond that is really the uh, question or the crux of the talk today. So the limits to the causal evidence for whether it extends to speech are that typically the results have uh, involved pitch changes in speech. So that livre d'image was a pitch change to the second last syllable of the sentence. In another article, and this was a very well-designed study, but the actual paradigm involved uh, remembering syllables that were matched to tones, so therefore the, the children then had, who were taking music lessons, had an obvious advantage, I would say. And in the other uh, true, uh, or relatively true experiment, there was uh, more than 50% attrition. So the uh, causal evidence, even for just listening in speech, is not uh, that compelling. And other evidence uh, points that music aptitude predicts the perception of pitch in speech, not music training. And we did a study where we looked at uh, non-native phoneme discriminations. This was just distributed, uh, just submitted a, a few weeks ago. And music aptitude predicted it, but uh, music training uh, did not. So this is uh, what's called an AXB paradigm. There are three syllables. This is all from Zulu, Zulu uh, uh, consonants. So they're, they're consonant vowel syllables. They're all different, but you, ju you have to judge whether the first one or the third one is more like the middle one. The first one. So those syllables, there are two different ones, but there are actually three tokens. Two say the same thing in the, to a Zulu speaker, one does it. And now the third one is like the one in the middle. Anyway, music aptitude predicts performance on those kinds of tasks, but music training does not when you're uh, measuring both aptitude, which should represent pre-existing abilities and uh, training at the same time. What about other language abilities? Well, it's true that musically trained kids tend to have larger vocabularies and better reading skills than untrained children. And there are lots of different results uh, pointing to this finding. And in adulthood, if you get, uh, there's a test that we use in English, uh, maybe you have one in Swedish as well, whether it's a measure of uh, pre-morbid intellectual abilities, the North American reading test. So you have to read words like time and cello and synecdoche and uh, things like that. And um, anyway, there's evidence that uh, musically trained uh, individuals are better at doing that kind of reading, and they're also better at making uh, grammaticality judgments. Of course, that doesn't say anything about uh, uh, causation. What about the causation for uh, vocabulary? When I was an author on this study, this came out, out in Psych Science. It was a four-week program that Sylvain Moreno designed, a computerized program in um, music listening or visual art. Every day, um, five days a week for four weeks. So after uh, 20 weeks of lessons, the music group had larger increases from pre to post test in vocabulary, but not in block design. These are both tests taken from the Whoopsie, the Wexler uh, IQ test for uh, young children. So vocabulary is just a test that says, what does this word mean? And then the uh, tester gives the uh, child one, zero, one, or two points based on the quality of the response. Block design, you might know, but it, involves, you see an image like that, and you have to arrange these blocks that are red on two sides, white on two sides, and red and white on two sides into the image like that. And so we didn't get a result for um, block design, but we got it for uh, vocabulary. And so, and because the children were randomly assigned to the different programs, uh, we inferred that music uh, listening, intensive listening training caused increases in vocabulary. And this is the result here. So before and after training, um, <coughs> for vocabulary, and you can see the music group went up, the visual art group uh, did not. And there was the same pattern did not hold uh, for block design. For reading, uh, I think the best result comes from a study, uh, this is a German study, so they had random assignment to uh, 20 weeks, so five days a week. It was only about 10 or 15 minutes a day, but still 100 uh, very short lessons in music training, phonological uh, awareness, which is uh, abbreviated as PA or sports. So this is really trying to measure phonological awareness, which is a predictor of uh, reading acquisition. So being able to tell that plump without the first P is lump. Right, so being able to isolate the different sounds or of uh, 
the language you're trying to learn. And what they found was that after the 20 weeks, the improvements in phonological awareness were evident among those who took the phonological awareness training, but they were identical among the music group, but not among the sports group, which rules out the possibility that it was just uh, maturity. So here's a figure, which is a very nice figure, I think. So you can see that the red line and the blue lines are really overlapping. Those are the phonological skills in the music program children, and the green line is essentially flat, and that's the control group who took sports. And another uh, uh, instance, these kids took six months of training in music or painting, so it was also a random assignment, and only the music group had improvement in pronouncing irregularly spelled words. This was done in Portugal, so they were analogous to time and cello, except, of course, Portuguese words with uh, unconventional spelling. And, uh, and there's another finding. Uh, this is from a Los Angeles study. There were low SES kids, and they had a longitudinal study. The control group declined in age-normed reading level, which was kind of normal for this group because it was the low SES uh, uh, typical pattern, and the music lessons halted the uh, decline. And there's also some uh, evidence that the results were better for kids who were more engaged in the lessons, which you might um, expect. And uh, when we get to talking about reading difficulties, particularly dyslexic and rhythmic training, I think here the uh, evidence is probably the strongest for causal effects. So in this particular case, uh, this came out in a PLOS One last year. Um, they had seven months of music, but it was primarily rhythm training because it was based on the notion that dyslexics have timing deficits that uh, prevent them from hearing uh, the sounds of speech uh, uh, adequately versus painting training. And the music group had larger increases in phonological awareness and in reading skills. And this was actually a true experiment. And um, there were also positive results of rhythm-based interventions for dyslexic kids um, after shorter uh, amounts of training. So, in general, I think that the rhythm training, dyslexia, ameliorating the uh, problems of dyslexia is actually probably the, very, uh, m the most promising result in the field uh, as a whole. But on the experimental evidence that had things more like a real music lessons or what we think of as, as music lessons, uh, they had much more limited success. So, Moreno et al. had three different tests of reading. There was only a significant result on one of them, that's the uh, irregularly spelled words, and in Slater et al, it was just the absence of a decline that was interpreted as a successful finding. And the other uh, causal findings arose from this intensive training and listening that didn't have any uh, instrumental or vocal training like we would normally consider to be music lessons, so it's really about intensive listening, then maybe somehow transferring to listening and speech, which Make, make sense, but it's not really music lessons as at least what I would think or somebody in North America would think. What about mathematics? Well, here the findings tend to be uh, the least consistent of all in terms of cognitive abilities. So if you look at what's out there, uh, the findings are positive, weak, or non-existent. And uh, my colleague, uh, Alan Winner from uh, Boston College, uh, did a study where she recruited only PhDs in math or PhDs in uh, language. So these were uh, professors from the American Mathematical Association and professors from the Modern Languages Association in the US did a broad survey on their musical abilities and there was no difference between groups. So if you're looking at an extreme group design where you're looking at people with lots and lots of mathematics, they should be good, have some evidence of being good in music and there was uh, none. So the link between music and math is a strange one because uh, it's very hard to, uh, to actually document. Visual spatial abilities has been another area that's been uh, examined in quite a lot of detail. So in general, uh, musically trained children and adults do better on the different kinds of tests you can give. So whether, whether a line is flat or not, m rotating an image, uh, memory for line drawings, visual search tasks, and the block design uh, that I showed you before. But there's almost uh, no well, there is no really compelling causal evidence. There is some that infer causation, but they tend to be from very, um, very uh, poor journals. What about uh, memory? Well, there's lots of evidence that musically trained uh, individuals are good at memory, and this can be tests of short-term memory, tests of long-term memory, and tests of working memory. 
And in some instances, it seems like it's an auditory memory advantage. So uh, it doesn't extend to vision. And this fits sort of with some theoretical frameworks that music sort of enhances your listening abilities, which then uh, translates into auditory uh, memory, which then translates into reading, which uh, uh, many colleagues believe to be true. But the problem is that if you uh, conclude that, then you have to ignore this whole other body of research which finds exactly uh, the opposite, namely that music training is associated with better memory for verbal and for visual material. And in some instances, you get better memory for the visual material than you actually do for the verbal or the auditory material. So you really, to sort of conclude that there's some neat pattern leading to uh, advantages in auditory memory, which actually makes conceptual sense, you really have to turn a blind eye to a lot of other uh, studies. So it's safe to conclude that music training is associated uh, with better memory. Uh, and what I think is that because uh, musicians tend to have superior listening skills, you probably have an increased power to detect an association if the materials are auditory. But in general, music training is accompanied by uh, better memory in a larger sense. For causal evidence, um, this uh, comes from um, the Yeki program. So this was a program in, um, implemented in Germany where they, where they gave instruments to individuals to, and they took lessons. But there was self-selection in uh, the group. So the German families decided whether their kids would enter the Yeki program or not. And uh, so there was nothing like random assignment. And self-selection could uh, definitely have played a role here. So that's not totally compelling. And in the work that I do with IQ scores, typically I get the same results with digit span uh, that I do um, with IQ. But I've only done one real randomized experiment. So that's not uh, that compelling that it's causal, although uh, digit span didn't differ from uh, anything else in the Wexler test music training, and IQ. Well, as you might expect from all the other results, given that uh, musically trained individuals tend to have better uh, verbal skills and uh, spatial skills, then it's not such a surprise that they also tend to have uh, higher full-scale IQs than untrained children. So then this raises the doubts about uh, the specificity of sort of a modular brain where language is isolated and also the notion that there are specific links between uh, music and other uh, types of abilities. And it's important to note that we, you might think, yeah, well, those kids who take music lessons, they also come from uh, families with higher uh, incomes and parents who are more educated, that's true, but it's not just me. Other labs have found that uh, the association remains evident after you hold constant uh, socioeconomic status. And when you look just in a quasi-experiment and you recruit kids, so this is not experimental data, but if you just recruit kids uh, in the neighborhood who ha have training or not training, so sometimes, uh, like if you take a sample of seven or eight-year-olds and they have one or two years of training, compare them to untrained seven or eight-year-olds, the difference in IQ can be 10 points, which there is no um, intervention that actually has that kind of uh, efficacy even if it's designed to improve um, IQ. And it's not just me who gets uh, sort of these large findings from uh, correlational data, also uh, studies in uh, Germany and the US. And there's also a, a dose-response association. So uh, if you look at training and treat it as a continuous variable, there's a positive correlation between uh, months of training, which we use in childhood. So we try to measure that as accurately as possible, and uh, higher IQ. I mean, the beta per month is a very small number, but if you say, well, what if the kid took, uh, um, let's say they take uh, 10 weeks, so let's say 30, 33 weeks, we'll say a year for six years, right? Then uh, you're starting to, you get like, a, you know, a eight points advantage uh, for um, IQ. Uh, notably, when you have very small sample sizes, so in the studies that I do with these correlational data, it's typically 150. If you have 30, 40, uh, it's much more likely to get an effect because the correlation between IQ and uh, music training and, and duration is about 0 0.25, 0 0.3 maximum. So it's much likely to be evident when the sample sizes are small. And if it's true that um, the more training you have, uh, 
uh, the smarter you get, then it should be the case that anybody who plays in a symphony orchestra is a genius, which is not true. Um, and uh, so it breaks down when you uh, compare uh, musicians to equally professional non-musicians. So if you compare uh, graduate students, let's say, at, uh, in Germany, or typically they're done in Germany, but also, also in the US uh, with uh, graduate students in music, with graduate students in psychology, then uh, you don't get the uh, same results. And often the, psychology, the music people lose. So in general then, the associations between music training and general abilities are more likely to be evident when music is an additional activity that's added to the child's repertoire as a whole. So that's the result I'm getting is in my context in North America where kids are taking music lessons, they're also doing a lot of other things, but it's true that when music is this additional activity that's added into uh, their environment, they tend to be smarter or high functioning kids and this cannot be attributed to SES or their other activities. So the causal evidence for IQ comes from uh, one study which um, people here seem to know about. It's kind of my pop single of uh, research that now I'm a has-been. But uh, anyway, it was a, you know, a random assignment of uh, 36 kids to each of four different groups. They had music lessons, keyboard or Kodai training taught at the Royal Conservatory, drama lessons or no lessons, and the pre to post test gains in full-scale IQ were larger for the music groups than for the control groups. And this was true for uh, the four index scores, so the four major dimensions of the Wexler test, as well as across uh, the subtests. So this is the um, figure from the article. You can see that everybody increased in IQ from the first to the testing session, so it could be a practice effect, but typically after a year, you're not supposed to get those. Uh, but there is the schooling effect that we know about. So everybody increased on average by about three points, but the kids in the... Um, keyboard and voice group by almost seven. <clears throat> and this finding has been replicated in other experimental studies um, conducted in uh, Greece for the first uh, uh, citation. I, no, Iran for the first citation, Greece for the last one, and Israel for the middle one. Uh, but in the Israeli and the Iranian studies, they had passive control groups, so they weren't doing anything. In addition, unlike the drama kids in my study, uh, so it's hard to know whether it was just additional training of any sort that was accounting for um, the increase uh, relative to the control group. And in Zephranis, uh, they just looked at pre and post test with no control group. Anyway, it's, it's uh, nice that it's replicated, but these other studies are not very uh, uh, convincing. So really a good evidence for causation comes uh, from a single study. But because we randomized the lessons and we wanted, we used a random number table, we put an ad in the local newspaper for free arts training. We explained to the parents uh, what was going to happen and we interviewed on them on the phone to make sure that they would agree regardless of the condition to which their kid was assigned. And then we went to their house and stared at them in the face and tried, because you know, if all the kids are dropping out, if they don't get the keyboard training, then you've ruined the internal validity of your experiment. And also because we needed, uh, the kids in the keyboard group obviously had to have a keyboard at home. So all the families had to have a keyboard with full size keys with at least four octaves. And we made them show that to us. Uh, so we really tried to be as rigorous as possible before we did the randomization, which involved an actual uh, random number table. Uh, but then that meant that, so when we, they came back, we didn't give them any instructions, so we just wanted to send them to the conservatory. I didn't want to get involved in the actual training and have it sort of specific to my own intervention. Um, but they didn't practice, so they came back to the lab after a year, so it was, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars spent on training these kids. And we said, how much does your kid practice? And they would say, oh, 10 or 15 minutes a week. You know, like, unashamed. Um, so, anyway. They didn't practice, and uh, if you were <laughs> if you were paying for this, I think you wouldn't let it go on for very long, right? Unless you just want to throw away money and you needed some place for your kid to go at that time. But uh, and also the effect size that you get in uh, experimental studies is much smaller than it is in the real world. So in the actual real world, or correlational or quasi-experimental settings, there has to be something else going on, I think, than this small effect that music may have on um, intellectual ability. 
Uh, and we also know, uh, and this is a recent data, data that we've collected with, uh, I collected with my uh, PhD student, Music aptitude also predicts IQ, so it's correlated with IQ, and it also predicts whether or not you take music lessons. So it's just kind of the same kind of finding that um, Frederick gets. But when you look at the association between music and training, music training and IQ with music aptitude held constant, then it disappears. But if you look at the association between aptitude and IQ, it remains evidence even when you hold training constant. So aptitude with training health constant really becomes some measure of pure musical ability, right, or natural talent. So in other words, these findings look like the correlation is that smarter kids uh, take music lessons. Music training and academic performance. This is uh, an interesting area because musically trained kids tend to do well in school. So this, I like, like this finding a lot because they looked at the kids' grades on the report cards. They knew which kids were taking um, lessons outside of school. This is done in Zurich. And uh, the kids who were taking private music lessons outside of school had higher grades in all subjects except for sports. Uh, and that was true when they held SES constant, which kind of rings true for me as a, <laughs> as a kid who took music lessons outside of school. <coughs> and. Um, I find in my work that the duration of playing music in childhood predicts uh, average grades in school, even in high school, and that in fact this association tends to be stronger than the IQ one, and more interestingly, it remains evident even when you hold constant IQ. So that there's something special about music training and being a good student, which implicates some other variable, right, probably personality. So that just to re reiterate this point, because it's important, kids who take music lessons tend to be better at school than their IQs predict. Right? So they have IQs, you'd expect them to do better, but they're actually doing better than that. <clears throat> the causal evidence for academic performance, well, there's none really. I mean, I was desperate. And I, I had five different subtests from an American test because these kids were Canadian, and I wanted to have something that was American for an American journal. But on five tests, the um, music groups had larger increases than uh, the control groups, which by a sign test is a significant uh, uh, one-tailed with a two-tailed test and two-tailed with a one-tailed test. So I'm really kind of grasping at straws here. I recently reviewed an article that got accepted that had much better evidence and it had something very close to random assignment where it looked like there was this uh, academic result, but it's... Um, it's not out yet, but anyway, that would, will be less weak than what I'm reporting here. Uh, what about social abilities? Well, sometimes uh, musically trained kids and adults do better at uh, detecting emotions conveyed by speech and by prosody in speech, but these all involve uh, pitch changes. So, for example, if you ask, if you take the fundamental frequency of an uh, uh, expression set in a typically, uh, stereotypically happy or sad way, so it might sound like this, or like this, and you have to say, was the computer happy or sad? <laughs> and you know, you can use more complicated emotions, and musically trained people tend to do better at that, but they're better uh, with pitch perception. And if you look at uh, something that goes beyond uh, pitch in speech, uh, there's almost no evidence that one-on-one -on -one music training has social or emotional benefits. So if you can look at adaptive social skills, which I've done several times, self-esteem or emotional intelligence, which I did among uh, undergraduates, and there was nothing there for uh, music training. I found that when I gave, um, this is from uh, Pons, he's in Norway, I think. Uh, um, he has a test called the Test of Emotion Comprehension. Musically trained uh, kids did better on it than untrained kids, but that was only because they had higher IQs, and when we held IQ constant, it disappeared. Now, this question is more interesting, because remember the last slide said one-on-one. -on -one. And now there is some evidence that group music interventions uh, may point uh, or cause, probably, some social improvements, uh, even when you test infants. And what I did is look at this uh, uh, program where the kids at one school, some schools in Toronto but not other schools, are uh, forced. I mean, forced sounds strong, but if they're in grade two at this particular school, they have one ukulele class a week for a whole year um, where they have to go. It's part of the program. 
And then you can look at other schools that are matched for SES and see whether the uh, pre to post test differences are the same for both uh, groups. So here's a, a, just a little video of um, the class. cute, right? So anyway, in this particular case, there was larger imp improvements in uh, paper and pencil measures of sympathy and general pro-social skills for the music kids, but only for those who started off with pure so poor social skills. So if you had sort of excellent social skills at the beginning, then it didn't matter, but on the other hand, it wouldn't need to matter. So that was a, a good result. It's almost like random assignment. I mean, it's not, there's no self-selection involved, but it wasn't exactly, actually random assignment. And the general consensus is now, and there's evidence from various experimental studies, that something about moving in synchrony leads to social cohesion, which I think is a very viable um, hypothesis. And um, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, not music lessons, but it's a very uh, cute videotape from uh, Laura Sorelli, who was a, a graduate student uh, from Laurel Trainer's lab. Anyway, um, you can see that the babies are either bounced in synchrony uh, with the experimenter or not in synchrony. And then uh, there was a test of whether they would help her. And they're more likely to help her after they bounced in synchrony. The music is twist and shout. Uh, those were actually staged videos. <laughs> they weren't part of the actual experiment. But uh, there's, and there's lots of uh, data in the developmental science paper explaining how they controlled that for, because that was actually Laura Sorelli who was had dropping the clothespin and how they had independent raters look at the videos and make sure she wasn't sort of biasing the babies who were in the, who had bounced with her in synchrony. So what about a pre-existing difference between uh, people who don't or do take lessons? Well. Uh, it's uh, well known that music training is associated with higher SES and also with greater involvement in non-musical out-of-school activities. And uh, higher SES is associated with a higher IQ and better grades in school. So, um, you know, there's this confounding variable. We measure SES and typically find that the association between music training and IQ survives that. But there's this um, clear sign that kids who take music lessons differ from other kids. <coughs> Might there be other variables? And I mentioned that personality is likely to be implicated because how musically trained kids are such good students. And the two um, personality variables that are the most likely to be implicated are openness to experience and conscientiousness. Openness to experience because it's the personality um, variable that's most interested in, uh, where the participant is the most interested in the arts. And it's also the one that has the strongest association with intelligence, where as a conscientiousness, um, is the best predictor of school performance. 
So openness to experience, if you don't know, you probably do, but uh, anyway, it's just active imagination, aesthetic sensitivity, attention to inner feelings, preference for variety, intellectual curiosity, and conscientiousness is just what the word means. So being responsible, orderly, and neat, attentive to detail, etc. So what we did is we took two large samples. They were both 150, so these had adults and 10 to 12-year-old kids. And what we wanted to do was predict music training. So now we're turning the tables on the whole kind of conceptual um, framework. And instead of letting music training be the predictive variable, we're now predicting music training. Although, of course, it doesn't matter, right? Correlation is x and y or y and x. It doesn't matter in terms of the actual number you get. But this is how uh, we framed it. Um, and what we found, is, so the outcome variable is duration of music training. So for adults, we found evidence for uh, SES, so parents' education was correlated with their IQ, personality, <coughs> openness, uh, openness to experience, and uh, IQ. So cognition, demographics, and personality all predicted uh, playing music regularly. And when you put these all together in a multiple regression framework, the partial associations were significant for all three. So each one made an independent contribution above and beyond the other. Now for children, and here's the figure from the article. So these are just correlations plotted visually. So it's just the, the size of the simple uh, association between uh, duration of training measured in months. And you can see from the graph that the highest or the best predictor is parents' education, which is kind of a stand-in for uh, parents' IQ. And then uh, next comes openness to experience. IQ is uh, 0.21, average grade in school, 0.25, and conscientiousness. So the two personality variables that we thought would matter did indeed uh, matter. But if you look at those um, bars and you think that music training is causing all those associations, I, mean, I think if you reframe the question and then you show those results, I think it becomes absurd to think that music training is having all the kind of ride-reaching effects, these transformative effects. It's certainly not causing differences in SES. Uh, and uh, what we found when we did the uh, hierarchical regression, because now we had more than uh, one variable at every step, personality variables did indeed predict duration of training when demographic and cognition was held constant, but uh, cognitive variables did not predict duration of training when demographic and personality variables were held constant. So if you hold constant individual differences in openness to, uh, openness to experience and conscientiousness, there's no association left between music training and IQ. And uh, if you're at uh, seven to nine years of age, when children are starting to take music, it's the parents' personality that matters more, uh, namely their openness to experience, which you would expect because the kid is more uh, passive in terms of their seeking environments that match their genetic uh, expression. <coughs> and duration of training in early childhood is also weakly associated with the child's openness and agreeableness, and neg negatively but weakly associated with the child's neuroticism, but really it's the child's agreeableness that's the strongest child's predictor, but it's the parent's openness that's the, the best one. And if you look then at that um, special link between music training and, and uh, school performance, which I kind of implied earlier was probably a, uh, a side effect of personality variables. So if you enter conscientiousness into that uh, regression, then the link between uh, music training and grade in school disappears. So it's really conscientious kids are taking music lessons and doing well in school. So uh, reported associations between music training and cognition may be an artifact of individual differences in personality. I don't have any background in personality, but it just seemed like a logical thing that was going on when I was looking at the results I was getting. Uh, you guys probably don't need these slides, but <laughs> just zip through them. So this is just all about Frederick, mostly, and Miriam. Uh, Genetics plays a role in determining music aptitude, achievement, flow, even the amount in individual practices, which is typically thought to be the environmental variable, but yet it's influenced by your genes. So variables such as practice, um, which are thought to be environmental and actually to undermine the notion of talent, are actually examples of gene-environment interactions. And uh, you probably know this inside out, but uh, there's one uh, genetic factor that uh, um, explains the association. It's more or less related to general cognition, and the other one is really about specific 
uh, music aptitude or something that is predicting performance specifically on the tests. But this really fits nicely with uh, the findings that we're getting um, in our lab. These two things, sort of music aptitude or natural musical ability and intelligence are predicting uh, who takes uh, music lessons. So uh, even when it seems likely that music training is causing improvements in, in some areas of uh, music pitch and speech perception, it's likely to reflect the gene-environment interaction in the sense that music aptitude is also associated with uh, perception of pitch and uh, perception of speech, like we heard on that phoneme uh, discrimination task. So uh, conclusions. Music training is associated with many non-abilities, non-musical abilities or traits. So that is absolutely true. But the question about whether it's causal is not uh, so clear. I mean, it's fairly safe to conclude that some kinds of music training, I mean, I can imagine that, you know, getting up in the morning at 7.30 and practicing every day for years on end, like I did as, you know, the weird little kid with music lessons, that had to have some, you know, effect on me. But whether it's systematic and similar for everybody, I, that's not so sure, so that's why I wrote enhance some abilities for some individuals, and these are likely to include listening skills, some higher level language abilities, and the abilities that are necessary to perform well on IQ tests. <coughs> and recent evidence suggests that group music lessons uh, have social benefits. There needs to be way more work on this subject, but I think it's something that the area can get kind of uh, uh, enthused about. The problems um, are that it's sort of partly safe to conclude that music lessons might be having some benefit, but it's completely safe, in my opinion anyway, to conclude that children who take music lessons differ in many ways from other children, even if they weren't taking lessons. So uh, just to restrict this to the kind of kids I study, there's uh, kids from Canadian suburbs, but they tend to, uh, kids who are taking music lessons tend to come from affluent families with highly educated parents. But in terms of personality, um, <coughs> Parents of children who take music lessons tend to score high on openness, where their kids are agreeable and open at a young age, and then open and conscientious at older ages. So there's these personality links with the music training. And these families are also more active in non-musical out-of-school activities. So kids who take music lessons come from families where they tend to also take swimming lessons and soccer and uh, whatever else, but they're, um, the families are keeping them busy. And we know that IQ and personality uh, are genetically determined, at least in part, as are many aspects of musical involvement. So that then questions the notion that music training is the causal factor here. Uh, so what I point is that these other differences between musically trained and untrained individuals, particularly aptitude and personality, which are so quick and easy to measure, uh, should be included in more experimental pro protocols before claiming that music training is the causal source of any association. Well, of course, you still can infer causation, but at least you can be sure it's not these uh, confounding variables. So the implications, the larger implications, uh, if, this is just my own point of view. So if a child seems musical, interested in learning music, yes, you know, it's not gonna hurt them. That's for sure. I guess, you know, if they hated it, it would hurt them. Could be, you know, traumatic or something, but, it's not, it might have some non-musical benefits. It's just it's not going to uh, reduce their intelligence. But I also think that advocating for inclusion of music in school curricula because of these um, non-musical side effects is misguided, because if they're not there, then you're more or less saying that music is useless. Right? Because you're justifying its inclusion based on these side effects, which is tacitly admitting that without them, it's not so justified. I think it's a big mistake. And also I think that if you have part of that as part of your scientific agenda, then it colors how you uh, see your data. And so what I'm claiming is that a best, better message is that music making promotes skill development and creativity in an inherently pleasurable context. And isn't it reasonable to teach kids about the only thing that makes people everywhere dance, dream, and connect with one another? Uh, so, thanks.